Hello and welcome to Wizard World Virtual Experiences. I'm Victor Dandridge, the hardest working man in comics. We are streaming to you live on Twitch, Facebook, and YouTube, bringing you that Comic-Con life to the comfort of your home with these free, free celebrity panels. In addition to paid exclusive experiences, including one-on-one -on -one private video chats, custom recorded messages, and autographs. Those are always on sale at wizardworldvirtual.com and will continue to be so throughout the week, even if you are watching a replay, definitely check out these once in a lifetime experiences with your favorite cast members and creatives. Uh, we're gonna have a live virtual signing uh, on July 11th at 10 a.m. PST, that's Pacific Standard Time. Uh, if you want to sign up for that one, visit wizardworldvirtual.com. Uh, it is my absolute pleasure, literally pleasure, to welcome to this virtual stage the New York Times bestselling author of World War Z, The Zombie Sur Survival Guide, and the new from Del Rey Publishing, Devolution. Let's hear it for Max Brooks, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, everybody. Hey. It is great to be here. Sir, how are we doing today? How are you surviving out here in this crazy time? Oh, surviving is a, a very, I think, accurate word given the times <laughs> that we're, we're living in right now. Indeed. I mean, we've, good Lord, we, we've got the, the, the pandemic of 1917, 1918. Mm -hmm, we've mm -hmm. got the social unrest of 1968. And we've also got the economic woes of the 1930s. So what a great time. Literally, 2020 is the book that you have written. Um, I just want to know how it ends. That's really what I'm looking for from this conversation. Uh, <laughs> you are, you are... You're that guy. You you have written those things. Uh, well, I certainly do write about survival, and I write about uh, us adapting our ways and our means, and coming together and finding a way through crisis. So, boy, uh, I, I wish I didn't have to live it so much, but <laughs> I do write about it. I mean, technically, that might make you the mother goose of our time, so we kind of need you. Uh, this is a very important thing uh, so that we have that sort of inspiration to, to get through here. Uh, speaking of, let's talk about this new book that features a focus on the Sasquatchalypse. It is Devolution, Talk to Me. This is this is a crazy, awesome title. Okay, well, the if I were a, a normal author, mm -hmm. I would read for you a section of the book. But I'm not a normal author. I'm a very, very, very dyslexic author who struggled with this learning challenge my whole life. And I've learned enough not to read from a prepared text, even if it's mine. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the book. Let's do it. We begin in a high-tech, high-end eco-community nestled in the Cascade Mountains. And these are not dirty, filthy hippies. Living <laughs> the grid. All right, this is not off-the-grid living. This is the grid. Because the whole premise of this little town called Green Loop is that the technological wizardry that we live in now allows us to have the comforts of the Upper East Side of Manhattan in the middle of the pristine wilderness. So these people, they wake up every day, they telecommute to work, they tap on their phones and an Amazon drone drops off their groceries. These are smart homes, so if anything goes wrong, it sends a signal down to Seattle where a handyman comes up in an electric driverless van, fixes something, and it really is the best of both worlds. This sounds like a near <laughs> utopia. It is, well, it, it is what I call, it's the new Levittown, because uh, right after World War II in Long Island, there was the model for how the suburbs are going to be, and it had everything that America in post-war life really loved. It had appliances, it had prefabricated houses, it had racial discrimination, it had everything. Everything that post-war America was really into. Right? Right. So this is the new Levittown. This is the new wired-in Levittown, where you can live anywhere and you can have it all. And it's working until Mount Rainier erupts. Whoa. And then these people are, and not only does it erupt, it blows out in the direction of Seattle and they're on the other side. So these highly educated, highly paid, civilized David Sedaris fans <laughs> to life. Okay, you, they're finding out that their, their advancement is not quite as advanced as they needed it to be. Yes, it, it, had, it, it, it was meant to take care of them, the system. And now the system is gone and they need to take care of themselves. And if that's not the worst of their problems because winter is coming and they need to stack stock up on food, 
happened and no more drone deliveries. If that's not bad enough, the eruption has also driven a pack of very large, very hungry Sasquatch creatures out of their traditional foraging route. Whoa, 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 whoa. And, yeah. And they need to stack up on calories as well. And they come up against a pen of sheep, which is these people. So oh my goodness. Um, it is feckless intellectuals versus Bigfoot. I'm sold. I'm already there. I need to read this 100%. I literally ordered mine from Amazon and it's not here yet. Those cursed drones didn't bring it to me yet. But we've got a question already from Dave Chin 2000. What kind of Bigfoot research did you do? Did you go looking for evidence? Okay. All right. Well, if anybody who knows anything about my work knows that the reason I write so few books is because I spend years and years researching. Mm -hmm. uh, so here's just a little taste of some of the books that I read. Slight uh, reading. It's just, just a little bit. Um, I went very deep into Sasquatch lore, but I've been into Sasquatch since I was a little kid. So I already knew about the lore. What the bulk of my research was is real primatology, real mm -hmm. apes, because the backbone of everything I write is what if something was real? So what if Sasquatch was real? It's not psychic. It's not supernatural. It's a species of great ape living in North America. So I had to go deep into that and discover if there was a species of great ape, how would they live? How would they have avoided human contact and what would make them dangerous? Wow. That's, that's yes, incredible. That's right. I can't wait to read the book to find out the answer to that question. Uh, let's see, moving on, we got Cyclone 5. What do you like to read or are reading right now, aside from that large tome library that you just showed us? Oh, I wish I had more time for fiction. I really do. You know, the problem is because I am dyslexic, uh, reading takes a lot out of me. And so thank God, thank God for audiobooks. Thank God. So I can listen to a lot of these books and take it in this way, which is better for my brain, but it doesn't leave a lot of room at the end of the day uh, for fiction. True. Um, but I, when I get a chance, uh, like right now I'm reading the true story of a group of Japanese survivors on an island after World War II, they didn't know the war was over. So they were there from, I think it was 45 to, I think maybe 51, maybe a little bit later. I'm right up to the point where they're starting to surrender, but it's, pretty intense to watch this group try to create a society still thinking that they are at war. Wow, that's wow, intense. That's yeah, intense. truly. Now, in terms of audiobooks, Devolution is available as an audiobook already, and it's kind of got an all-star cast. How did that come together? Well, that I mean, that comes together, honestly. The, the, the long version is that because I am dyslexic, I've always needed audiobooks, and this goes back to my mom, God bless her, who in high school took all my reading list Mm -hmm. to the Braille Institute for the Blind and had it all put on audio cassettes so I could hear it and then I could get through high school. God bless her. Uh, mm, sorry. No, 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 I understand. Moms, man. Moms, you only get one. You're out. So as a result, uh, I've always taken audiobooks very, very seriously. And so I have tried to make sure that the audio versions of all my books are as good, if not better, than the printed word. So if you've heard World War Z, you know what I'm talking about. This one, no different. And I am very lucky that Random House allowed me to do this. So I wrote to all these people and we've got Kate Mulgrew. We've got Mira Furland. We've got Nathan freaking Fillion. We've got Jeff Daniels. I mean, we just go and go and go. Uh, we've got Steven Weber from, I think there was a movie called Dracula Dead and Loving It. And I think he did some other stuff. Uh, but we also got me. But here's Absolutely. the thing. That's why this book is delayed a month because we safely could not get people in the studio. So Random House had to mail out giant crates of audio equipment and we all look like domestic terrorists. <laughs> we had to set up studios in our homes and I set up mine under my stairs. And if you follow me on Twitter, there's pictures of me, you know, crammed under there looking a, a mix of Harry Potter and Das Boat. <laughs> now that's a new book series. I think we're gonna need to see that from you. Just throwing it out there. Uh, let's see, John Shannon has asked, are there any plans for a new survival guide, especially with the state of the current world? I mean, this one is a comprehensive book as is, but a new one could be cool, especially with, with Yetis. So, well, it, it's funny you say that. I mean, in the times we're living in now, certainly with COVID-19, uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but you know, I'm on two separate think tanks. 
One is, one is a, a quasi-government think tank called the Brent Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security. And the other one is a military think tank called the Modern War Institute at West Point. Part of my job for both of them is trying to communicate big plans to the regular voter schmuck like me. And this is the problem with COVID-19. Hey, everybody, we had a plan. Look, here it is, the National Response Framework. And here's the annex, biological oh. incident. So you don't need a book from me. You got it. But then how do you communicate it? So, I mean, the other day I was literally at a big government think tank Zoom meeting. with And I said, find interesting ways. Find interesting ways to communicate these big ideas the way we used to do. You know, do it like you did in World War II. Go back to Schoolhouse Rock. Biological incidents annex to response and recover federal interagency operation plans. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I am a plan, a way to save humans. Right. I'm with you 100%. Okay. Song stories, they're so important. Uh, Brian McDonald has actually said that that's the whole point of stories is survival. And that is a big part of what you do. You tell the greatest survival yes. stories which is fantastic. Uh, let's see, we've got Nicholas Banks. Best piece of Bigfoot footage you've seen through your research? <clears throat> well, you know, there's obviously the Patterson film, but when I was a kid, that scared the hell out of me. <laughs> that was like the Zapruder film for Gen Xers. And you know, we watched it, we watched every frame. As a grown-up, you then look at, you study the research behind the film and you go, oh, okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. Here was a guy who specifically was about to make a Bigfoot movie. And I think he even confessed the fact that he had already made a Bigfoot suit and paid for it already. Right, and then right. he like, I think he went into the wilderness to test his camera and oh my God, there was a Bigfoot and I just happened to get it on film. Yeah. Okay. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. We're not buying it. Although historically, maybe that's the first Blair Witch Project. However you want to look at it, there you go. Yeah. Uh, let's see, Jamie uh, 6600 asks, do you have a favorite book or series recommendation? Oh God, oh yes. All right, as a Gen Xer, uh, if we're talking about Bigfoot, I would yes. encourage everyone to go back and, and it's on YouTube and watch The Mysterious Monsters. Uh, Bigfoot, The Mysterious Monsters. Cause that's the one that scared the crap out of me because I didn't know, I was six years old on the floor playing with my GI Joes. Uh, and then suddenly here comes this, tall gentile with white hair named Peter Graves. And he was gonna prove Bigfoot was true. Exhibit A, the footprints. Exhibit B, the photographs. Exhibit F, the visions of a psychic detective who was psychometrizing. <laughs> That's a real word from me. So That's a good watch word. it and you will understand where the inspiration for my book came. That is stellar, that is stellar. Now, obviously you growing up in a very famous household, how important were stories to you growing up? Well, I grew up in a family of, of storytellers. And, you know, that was, once again, I was very lucky because I had my mom who was a closet scientist. Uh, her name was Anne Bancroft and the world knew her as Mrs. Robinson, mm -hmm. uh, but she, that's not who she was. She was someone who was fascinated by germs, by microbes, by the spread of disease. That's how we know all this stuff now. My mother taught it to me. Her favorite book was The Microbe Hunters and she would read it to me. But she would read it to me as an Academy Award winning actress. Wow. So my mother knew how to make education entertaining. And that set me on the path of everything I do. That's one of the reasons that all my books are steeped in research. I try to educate through entertainment. That's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, Thomas Beck had to ask it. I totally understand. Says, hey, Max, how is your dad doing? Oh, my dad is fine. He's 93, about to be 94. And if you saw the video that we did together where I'm waving to him through a window, uh, that's real. I have not hugged him since this started and I won't until there's a, a vaccine because as I said in the video, I'm statistically, if I get it, I would probably be okay. But if I give it to him and he gives it to Carl Reiner, who gives it to Dick Van Dyke, I wipe out a whole generation of comedic legends. Man. So that's the thing, right, folks? You know, that's why when we go outside, it's not just about us. It's about who we can infect. 
So my dad is okay because I'm going to make damn sure he stays okay. I love you for that. Uh, I think that video, it, it told the truth that we all needed to hear in a way that we could both kind of laugh a little, but still get the message. And I think that's that's perfect storytelling, man. That's, that's absolutely the way it should be. Um, <clears throat> So while we wait for a couple more questions, I know we're going to talk about devolution and there's only so much that we can talk about without giving too much away. But is this kind of a commentary on where we are as a society that's constantly evolving and integrating technology into what we do and how that takes us away from our general basic skills? Yeah, one, one of, the, of the points I'm trying to make in the book is our over-reliance on a technological world that's being built for comfort without resilience. And what, what I mean by that is uh, everything's getting more comfortable, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, look what we're able to do. And you can tap on your phone and anything can get delivered and you can binge watch anything you want. And that's great. And I'm all for that. I'm not a Luddite. I don't believe in going back. I want to go forward. But I want to go forward with our eyes open, understanding what could go wrong. You know, perfect example is driverless cars. Everybody loves the idea. I love the idea. However, the number one tool of terrorists today is driving cars into crowds mm -hmm. and anything that's networked can be hacked. So I'm not saying don't do driverless cars, but if you don't put a manual kill switch in, I mean, a physical lever that you just pull and cut the power, then we're going to be putting millions of guided missiles on the road. And if you ever want to see a monument to technology without thinking about a plan B, look at the Empire State Building because it was literally built with an airport on top for dirigibles, because it was just assumed that the future would find us all commuting to work in giant bags of flammable hydrogen. What could possibly go wrong? What? No yeah. one saw that one coming. No one saw that one coming. So that's one of the things I was trying to do in this town of Greenloop. It's so comfortable. My God, we can live in the wilderness, but we're city folk. And then suddenly when they're cut off, they're living in the wilderness the true wild. Now, obviously you've, you've made a, a new piece of weaponry back there. Uh, what, what would you first describe that as and how long did it take for you to figure out how to make it? Okay, well, this, this goes to what I do with research. I have to read a lot of books. I have to also talk to a lot of experts, people who really know what they're talking about to talk me through some of my issues in a book. But the, the third part of my research is hands-on. I've got to do it. Like with Green Loop, I actually found a place in the Pacific Northwest where I would have put the town. And I had to physically go there to see if our characters could just hike out. Well, I got news for you, you can't even hike in. That's how punishing it is. There's a scene in my book where they realize, like remember in Alien 3 when she has, we have no weapons of any kind, right. neither do they. They don't even have any tools. They don't even have a toolbox under the sink. Why should they? Smart home, signal to the handyman. So they had to make weapons with whatever they had around them. And I had to see, could I physically do it to see if it was possible? Here's one of them. This blade is a sobakiri. It is a, a cleaver meant to chop up uh, buckwheat into soy, I mean, sorry, into uh, noodles, soba noodles. And this is just regular bamboo. And this is just regular wire from a lamp, from a floor lamp. So I had to see, could I do this with the only tools being a scissor, a rock, and a little paring knife to make these holes? And I did it. So when you see my characters do it, it can be done. Can be done. Now, have you used that to cut wood or through any miscellaneous objects? Oh yeah, I had to see if it, if it would hold up. Because if this thing's gonna be a weapon, I gotta see the punishment it can take. I used it to cut more bamboo and also to help chop uh, the handle off another knife so I could make a spear. Oh my God, that's incredible. That's literally incredible. Um, okay, so when you're building these worlds and you're talking about fully fleshed out characters and circumstances, how difficult is that to integrate new characters into those circumstances so that you're not just plot focused, but literally building people that exist in these worlds? Well, just like the research into the world, I have to research the people. So everybody in, in Green Loop in this town uh, they're all real. Some of them are amalgams where I took personality types and backstories of people that I know. And some of them are direct people that I know. And because I, it has to be real for me. Uh, 
the character of Mostar, she's an amalgam. She's based on someone I know, for example, but that person is not from the former Yugoslavia. So I had to speak to people who had actually lived through the sieges in the former Yugoslavia to get the, the cultural details to make it right. So that's the kind of stuff that I, that I have to do. That's brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. And it creates like such a very similar to it's a, it's a reality based thing where even if you have different cultures or standings from these people, they seem just as real as anyone that you might meet on the street because you, you could. Yeah. And, and this is something I struggle with because I'm an only child and I grew up in my room. Uh, so for me, dialogue is always, is always hard. So it, in, in some books, it's easy. Like uh, World War Z, it's just people telling their stories. But when I did the Harlem Hellfighters, Oh my God, to get, to get historically correct dialogue mm -hmm. of young African-American men in Harlem in 1917, that literally was a year of research to just to try to figure out how these guys talk to each other. Uh, and good Lord, that, that was rough. And I got very lucky because I found a movie called Men of Bronze, which had the last two living hellfighters. And one of them, Melville T. Miller, I just watched him constantly listening to me. I call him my dialogue coach. And I was like, all right, how would, how would I say this? How would I say this? Because as a writer, I'm good, at, I'm good at description. I'm good at research. I'm good at building worlds. But dialogue, I always have to keep my eye on the ball. Nothing wrong with that. That's authenticity, <laughs> and that's appreciated, like truly. Um, okay, so obviously with World War Z, we know the story that the book hadn't quite come out yet, and there was an option already made. Are we seeing something similar for Devolution? Well, the crazy thing was Devolution initially was a movie. <clears throat> I wrote it as a movie, uh, or I wrote the idea as a movie and I sold it right. to Thomas right. Tull at Legendary and he loved it. And here's the crazy thing about Thomas Tull. I pitched it to him. He got so excited. He ran out of the conference room and came back from his office with an actual plaster cast of a Bigfoot foot. <laughs> so we were off to the races. And we got ourselves a writer and a director in the whole development process and it never went anywhere. And I wasn't too disappointed because it was slowly veering away from my original vision. And then my wife said to me, go to Legendary again and ask for the novel rights back. And I did. And Thomas, God bless him, gave me just the book rights, which is all I wanted. So I wrote the book and now Legendary is so excited they want to make the movie again. So we're, That's awesome. back, we're back on track. Let's see what happens. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm throwing this out here. Are we saying that, you know, Yetis, Bigfoots are going to be the next, you know, new thing in, in pop culture? You know, they're going to take the place of zombies? I have absolutely no idea what takes the place of anything. I, I am so bad at spotting trends, which is why I write for me. You know, there are there are some great writers and I and I admire them and I'm jealous of them who can look at the public, the market, the zeitgeist, and they can go, that's that's gonna be big or that's big. I'm gonna I'm gonna fill that niche. That is not me. Uh, all I can do is write what I'm passionate about, you know, and sometimes sometimes I get lucky, sometimes it hits, like with my zombie stuff. Uh, you know, sometimes it doesn't. Let's let's see what happens with this one. All I know is is I wrote it because I've been passionate and scared of Sasquatch since I was six years old. I respect it. Uh, Dave Chen, two thousand, ask again: What is the most important survival tip you could give for surviving a Bigfoot or zombie attack? Well, they're two completely different things. Um, zombies, it's like surviving a pandemic. So, what you would need to survive in a real pandemic is probably what you would need to survive. A zombie plague, so pandemic with a side of social unrest. Bigfoot is all about nature. That's what this book is about, is people thinking they're living in harmony with nature without ever understanding it, without ever respecting it. And that's the point, is when you go to nature, you're in her house mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you need to play by her rules. You are a guest and you can't bring your own rule book and expect it to conform. I mean, I think there were some shark attacks in Florida years ago, and this this lady on YouTube was saying, like, what do you expect? You're in the shark's house. It's not an attack. <laughs> you know, yeah. I totally agree with it. Now, if I'm in a shower and I get a tap on the shoulder, I turn around and there's a shark and it gets me, that's a shark attack. Right. You know, that, if you're that's a little different. Exactly. You swimming in the ocean, that's a home invasion. Literally, they're yes. protecting their house. So I totally get that. Um, I want to make sure I pay some bills real quick. So I want to give a quick shout out to the fans watching live 
or later on Twitch, Facebook, YouTube. Don't forget to check out those paid exclusive experiences like the ones uh, on private video chats, autographs, custom video, recorded messages, all that goodness at wizardworldvirtual.com. I will remind you later on that that's where you need to go to get some of this cool. Um, going back to you, Max. So obviously Wizard World as, a, as an awesome comic convention place started off with magazines. And one of the best things that used to be in the magazine was a casting call. So if you could, for, I mean, whether you know or not, who would you like to see play some of the characters in Devolution? Well, I, listen to the audiobook. You know, uh, starring starting in the audiobook is Judy Greer. She's nice. our main character, who has done I think eleven thousand projects, movies, and TV over the course of her wow. career. I I don't know them all. But I don't she's care. awesome. <laughs> what I care about is that she was an archer, and <laughs> which I give a shout out to in the book. That's and awesome. So Judy is Judy is amazing. Well, I mean, you'll see you'll see everybody who. Uh, who plays all these roles and see if you can picture them, just like uh, all the roles I cast in in World War Z. Brilliantly said, brilliantly said. Um, now, I, the videos that I've seen of you talking, you're generally speaking a very funny guy, but you manage to write things in a very serious way. Is that something that you struggle with balancing or is it just a natural showcase? No, you know what it is? It's because I'm not a funny guy. I'm a, I'm a serious, shy introverted guy who can be funny respect uh, respect because because to me humor is a survival skill like anything else it's a social survival skill and i had to learn that because my parents were both celebrities if my parents had been accountants i could have just lived in my little world but they lived a public life so i was always dragged into that public life and there were expectations and so i had to learn to do that so as a result, I can do it and I can be funny and I love going to cons and I have a great time. The difference is for an introvert being extroverted when the con is over, instead of like going out for a drink or, you know, hanging out with people when it's over, I am so drained. I mean, I go back to my room and all I want to do is order room service and just like watch Iron Man. And that's I'm with it. you. <laughs> it's got to decompress a little bit. I get yeah. that. I get that. Nicholas Banks asks, any comic book projects on the way? You know, that is, that's interesting. We, we just had one. We had mm -hmm. one. Part of my work in uh, government circles, in think tank circles, was working for the Blue Ribbon Bipartisan Biodefense Panel. And these, these are big ways. This is Tom Ridge, our first Secretary of Homeland Security, and Senator Joe Lieberman and, and Donna Shalala. And what they're trying to do is get us ready for the next round of germ warfare, which is really scary because we're getting to a point very soon where any crackpot with the internet and eBay will be able to cook up a germ in their basement. That's the bad news. Good right. news right. is we can totally be ready for that. Uh, so, but how do we tell the public how to do their part, how to get ready? And how do we re-educate the public about germ warfare? Because it's been going on for thousands of years. So I was commissioned by them to do a comic book. You can, if you, Go to my Twitter feed. You can scroll down. It's there. It's called Germ Warfare, A Very Graphic History. And that's what it is. It's a comic book about the history of germ warfare from uh, people in ancient times dipping their arrows uh, into manure and blood, <laughs> giving people infections, to obviously the famous one of giving out infected smallpox to uh, Native Americans. And by the way, uh, germ warfare from the Confederacy in our Civil War, there was a doctor trying to give infected blankets uh, to spread a plague up through the North. So something more to think about when we rip down those statues. Right, uh, right, right. Up to World War II, where the Japanese had a huge biological weapons program to this day, where they dropped plague bombs, please, with, with bubonic plague on China. And to this day, we don't know how many Chinese died. It could be anywhere between 100,000 and a million. Uh, wow right now where there are stockpiles even now of biological weapons all over this planet and but the good news is folks a germ is a germ and if we have a good robust public health system doctors and healthcare workers and we believe in science and vaccines mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. they can't touch us in the words of nc hammer that's very, very true. If you guys go to uh, your website, maxbrooks.com, there's a free download on there. It's only 35 pages, but it is a brilliant read. I read it just the other day, and I'm not certain that you're not a time traveler, 
uh, because some of the things that you say, I'm like, yo, that's like right now, isn't it? What? Um, there, there was a lot of things that you seem to uh, have, have, you know, brought out into the to the sphere of things to see. This is what we can do as as people. Is that something that plays up uh, in in devolution? That the bad guy of humanity kind of comes out. Yeah, and this is this is a theme in all of my writing, which is you don't know what you're capable of until you're tested. And these are my characters. Uh, some don't rise to the challenge, but others, others who think that they're total losers and, and useless and worthless realize, oh, wow, I, as in the words of my dad, there's more to me than there is to me. Uh, there, there are hidden talents and hidden strengths that I didn't even know I had. And that comes from every everything I write about. I'm a very positive guy. I also believe that in society. I believe that if people are just given a chance to prove themselves, then we can rise to the occasion. I see so much just untapped strength and talent all around me. And I say this in think tank world, you know, all the people, all the sheep dogs who protect us sheep, right. I don't, let us in, find ways to engage us, give us a chance. You know, we will prove that we have something to contribute. Oh, that's so very well said. Something that I think we all need to hear. Um, so many people are, are drawing lines divisively, but finding those things that will bring us together is so very important. And I appreciate uh, you saying that. Um, when it comes to uh, writing stories, uh, I, I've heard you famously say that stories kind of come to you. They, they tell you what they yeah. are going to be. Um, for those that are writers in the audience, myself included, uh, can you talk about how you develop your process for writing? Yeah, I'll tell you that the story dictates the format. Mm -hmm. Like Zombie Survival Guide, duh. It's got to be a guide, a straight up manual how-to. That was just it. it. It wrote itself in that way. Uh, same thing with World War Z was, how do I tell the big picture? Because you know, that's the problem I always had with so many zombie stories was you have a huge global zombie pandemic and yet you're focusing on a teeny tiny little group of people. That's like trying to learn about World War II from watching Saving Private Ryan. But <laughs> When I was a kid, I listened to the audiobook of The Good War by Studs Terkel, an oral history of World War II, where he interviewed people from all over the world. And for the first time in my young life, I got a picture of how big that war really was. And so right. for World War II, I thought oral history, perfect. Same thing, Harlem Hellfighters had to be visual. Because if I wrote it as a straight up novel, first of all, I wrote it as a straight up novel, the only people who would read it would be like, old men who already know of the story. The fact so check, you make sure you get it right. Yeah, I wanted, I wanted to reach a younger audience, but also it has to be a visual story because race is visual is what we see. And so I didn't want the reader to ever forget for a second what skin color these guys were because these guys were never allowed to forget what skin color they were. So graphic novel, that's what I tried to do as a movie first. But in the 90s, uh, you know, the pinnacle of American cinema was Jason Biggs sodomizing an apple pie so no thank you but as a comic book as a graphic novel i get all the rich visuals without the heavy budget of a movie now with this one uh i wanted there to be mystery because what the, the premise the the book begins with the the town being destroyed after we're sort of cleaning up the wreckage of seattle and tacoma uh, a ranger team looking for survivors suddenly stumbles across this utterly destroyed community and they go, wait, it's outside the blast zone. What happened? And how do you piece that apart? And so I thought a journal was a great core because that way we get to read what happens as it's happening, but it leaves it open-ended because if you do it as an oral history, you know who survives, you know who didn't <laughs> survive. A journal is mystery, and then I put in interviews with experts to give us also a bigger picture. Because like I said, you don't want the, the Private Ryan tight little picture. I want something bigger. So a few experts who come in as the Greek chorus, and we get a full story of what happened to Green. Wow, that's incredible. I cannot wait to get my hands on that one. Um, okay, so also as a writer, uh, you actually commented once uh, at San Diego, I believe, about how the difference between World War Z, the book and the movie allowed for you to divorce yourself to appreciate yeah. what they did. Do you often have that you know, uh, sense of things with your own writing? Do you get to divorce yourself from it and just read it? Or is it so much yours that you can't quite separate? Oh God, no, no, see, I, I no. Um, 
you know, my writing process, the psychology of my writing process is very schizophrenic because the first draft, the rough draft, the goal is just to write the end. You, you, you don't want to be critical in your first draft. Otherwise, you'll never get to the end. If you're worried about it being good, you'll keep stopping and editing and redoing. So no, no, no. You, at least I do. I got to go balls out and be all ego. So I'm writing my first draft no matter what it is. And I'm like, ha, ha, suck on this, Mark Twain. <laughs> and I'm loving it. And I'm a, oh my God, I'm such a genius. Wow, boom, it's surprise. First draft. Then you have to go back and that's the real writing. That's where the real... That's when it becomes a job. And that's when the self-criticism comes in. Mm -hmm. So then I go from being, oh my God, I'm a genius. Give me my Pulitzer to, oh my God, I suck so hard. This is so bad. What was I thinking? And then I come out the other side balanced in what I hope is what my father would call finished enough. And then I put it out into the world. And it's hard to divorce myself because like I said, finished enough. You can always do more. You can always, mm -hmm. you can always polish. You can always make it better. And if I read my own work, I'm always thinking, oh God, I could have made this so much better. Why didn't I think of this? So it's hard to do that when I look at, look at my own stuff when it's out in the world. Respect. Uh, let's see. Mildred Fierce says, uh, oh, she says, hi, number one. Uh, thanks for doing this event. And wanted to know, how did you get interested in Minecraft? Minecraft, okay, I'm, I'm fiercely proud of that book because this once again goes back to many things, starting with my dyslexia, right? The education system that we have in this country is based on the Prussian model. And the Prussian model is study something, there's one way to solve a problem, you solve the problem and you bump it up to the next level. That's how our military works. Incidentally, isn't that how most of our video games work? right? Nope. There's only one way to solve a problem. You solve it that one way that they intend you to solve it. And then you get bumped up to the next level. That wasn't me in school. I had to think smart and work smart and find coping mechanisms around. I had to creatively solve problems if I was just going to survive. Then I got older and more educated and I went out in the world. And incidentally, in all the think tanks that we study. And let me tell you, you should all know this, especially if you're citizens of a, of a democracy. The old way of doing things is obsolete. The old way of if I study this fact and then I memorize and then I vomit it out uh, and I get good grades and I can move up. That's not how it works anymore, folks. All the big systems of the 20th and 19th century are collapsing. The new way is to think creatively and to find different paths to solve problems. Our military understands this now. They had 20 years of Iraq and Afghanistan and they try to do it the Prussian way. By the way, they same thing in Vietnam. Right. Right. The business community is starting to understand this. The governments, not our government, but you know, other governments <laughs> are starting to understand this. So how do you solve the problem? Well, you solve it at the young level when our brains are still forming, when we're children, you teach the way to solve problems creatively. Well. We have the greatest teaching tool in world history, Minecraft. You have a video game where you have a problem, say, don't starve. Well, instead of one way to solve the problem, you have a hundred ways to get there and a hundred ways to do those hundred ways. So you can craft your own unique way of solving your problem. And it teaches independence and it teaches uh, how to recover from failure and resilience. It teaches everything. So when I saw my son playing this, I thought, oh my God, this is a teaching tool. And then when I was asked to write a Minecraft book, they said, well, do you have any ideas? I go, I got all the oh, ideas. <laughs> I have an idea, let me tell you. So yeah, go Minecraft. That's awesome. Uh, Jay Kepler says, uh, Max, you hinted conspiracies and cover-ups of outbreaks and infections within World War Z and the survival guide. Will you revisit that train of thought again in some format? Well, the thing, the thing about conspiracies and cover-ups, I think they're fascinating because it all depends on what system of government that you have. Uh, so I do, I've been writing all these op-eds about it recently uh, because the truth is the only innocent people in all this are the Chinese people because they don't get a vote. And they, the truth was hidden from them. And when this is all over and their dead are buried, uh, they're still stuck with the same guy and the same government. Uh, we don't have that. And th this is what I cannot say enough. I, I'm, I'm sorry if I, I get preachy, but 
we are we're not subjects. We are citizens. We have the right to vote. And by the way, a hell of a lot of people suffered and died for that right to vote from Mm -hmm. Iwo Jima to Alabama to a lot of women who got their jaws broken a little over 100 years ago for the right to vote. So if we don't like our leaders, we need to look in the mirror and then we need to run down to the ballot box because we're the boss and we have the power to change things and the buck stops with us. Oh my God, that's so well said. I don't I don't know of a better question that could follow up with that one. I'm gonna do my best though. Because ah. uh, <laughs> I wanna keep this conversation going. Um, you you have so many brilliant ideas that um, on, the, on the surface are simply based in common sense. Um, how often do you find pushback from some of the things that you've written? Oh, oh my God. <clears throat> My, my, favorite, my favorite pushback that, I, and, that I've gotten, and I got this at almost every single con I've wow. ever been to. There's always someone in the audience who raises their hand and says, listen, listen, with zombies, don't you think we would do better now because now we know about zombies? You know, now we understand. You know, we have all this zombie fiction, all this zombie education. So don't you think we would know? To which I say to them, I used to say to them, yeah, in Hurricane Katrina, they knew about water. See, this is, this is the thing is, and, and this is actually a discussion I have had at the top levels of think tank government world, uh, which is what's called a failure of imagination. Because there are times when those who protect us suffer from a failure of imagination. You know, terrorists flying planes into buildings hadn't been done before. So it, it takes a cognitive response to jump to that and go, huh, could they do that? So that's a failure of imagination. But the plague we're living in now We've had plagues since the beginning of time, right. which is why we have a CDC, which is why we have a national health service, which is why we have doctors, why we have science. This was not a failure of imagination. This was a failure of competence, courage, and compassion. Mm. And so I think that's a problem when I get this pushback, you know, about people saying, well, we know about zombies. Saying, well, yeah. We know about a lot of things. The fact that my fellow Angelinos right behind me, we all live in the shadow of the big earthquake that we know is coming. And yet, why were so many of my fellow citizens around me punching each other for toilet paper? You should have already had that, along with a lot of other emergency supplies. Because if you think lockdown for a pandemic is something, try an earthquake. Oh, my gosh. I, I think failure of imagination really kind of cycles right back to the theme of devolution and how these were people that thought that all the things that they needed were already given to them. They don't have to right. think of what they need to survive. And right back to it, that's that common sense factor. There are things that you should just need to know. You just need to know how to do it. You do. And, and this goes to my psychology. People say, well, doesn't do, writing about this, doesn't it make you nervous? And I go, no. I actually was already nervous, but the knowledge, the research, that calms me down. It's like when I get into my car, I, I don't have to worry about being killed in a horrific accident because I know that the people designing the car have spent decades being forced, they didn't do it on their own, they were forced to put in seatbelts and airbags and crash tests and all that stuff. I know that my government has rules of the road and stop signs and lights and things like that. And I know that I have been trained in to drive a car and I needed to prove that to get a license. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. therefore, all these safeguards have been in place exactly so I don't worry. Way to arm with education, information. It's perfect. It's it's literally the basis of uh, knowledge is power, and you are invoking it. That is that is perfect. Um, I want to give a quick shout out one more time to uh, the people watching. Again, if you guys get a chance, visit wizardworldvirtual.com, where you can get some of the coolest things: private video chats, autographs, custom videos, all that cool stuff to make this a commemorative experience. Don't let being at home stop you from having a great con experience. That's what this is all about. So make sure you do that. Um, and we also are going to have a signing, a book signing, virtual live book signing, July 11th with Max. Um, this is going to be fantastic. I'm definitely going to sign up for this one because I, I need the book signed. Uh, I might have two copies. It, it, I'm guilty. I can't help it. I'm kind of a fan. Um, so just as we have our last few minutes, um, while we wait a couple questions uh, coming in, do you have anything that you just want to riff on? Anything that's on your heart and mind that you just want to get out for your your readers to know? Yeah, you know, here, here's the thing is, is that I, I'm a big passionate advocate of, of education. 
but education any way you can. Because, you know, being dyslexic, I always found that school got in the way of my education. Uh, but I feel that there needs, to, we need to get back to fusing fiction with education because I'm not the first guy to do that. By the way, wasn't that all of science fiction? Wasn't 100%. that every episode of Star Trek? I mean, nothing upsets me more uh, than when I see people make these amazing stories, but they don't say anything with them. And I'll just one thing I will riff on very quickly is nothing also upsets me more when I see historical fiction that doesn't pay attention to history. Because, he, especially as an American, because here's the thing is, we, we have a long way to go in this country, a long way to, in order to get to the place where we finally live up to the ideals that we hold us together. But just because we have a long way to go doesn't mean we can ignore how far we've come. Mm -hmm. And the study of history is very important to me because I want people to be able to also take courage and hope and honor all the people who came before us, who fought so hard and gave up so much so we could at the very least get to this point and pick up the torch and keep going. And if we see social progress, any progress in this country, scientific, social, whatever, as a process, you know, we're not gonna wake up one morning and it's just there. Every step is a step forward in the long term. And historical stories, fictional, exciting, interesting, I think we need to make more of those. We need to tell the American story and be accurate so people go, wow, all right, that was a long road we've came down and there's a long road forward. That is awesome. <laughs> oh my God, yeah, people be proactive in, in the stories that you tell, the stories that you're a part of. Um, history is a story. Uh, I One of my last questions, obviously you being a history major um, and looking back on uh, you know where we have been, what is a, a place that you hope that we get to within your lifetime? What is a, a piece of history that you wanna see? You know, I, I don't I don't know if this will ever happen because, you know, we're human beings. And I think Dr. Seuss said it perfectly with the, the star belly sneeches. Oh my we're God, I just read that this morning. Oh my I God. I mean, he's he's a genius. He's a freaking genius. He's a Greek philosopher. This, this notion that there's something in our psyche that we must divide ourselves, that we must say, well, they have a star in their belly and we don't. And we do it to ourselves. We do. I would love to get to the point where we we have equality where everybody gets a fair shake, you know, because the truth is I would love to have a society where everybody, we all put in to make sure that every child in this country has the opportunity to unlock their potential, right? Every kid has the right to good nutrition, good education, being able to walk down the street at night and not have to worry about either criminals or cops. So by the time they get to be 18 years old, by the time they're legal adults, they have been given everything they need to then choose their life. And that way, if they wanna sit on the couch and smoke weed and play video games, that's nobody's fault but their own. Right. But, but if they want to, as Malcolm X once said, probe space or cure cancer, then we as a society have allowed them to. Because if we unlock that potential, guess what? we all benefit. So I would love at least, not in my lifetime, maybe in my son's lifetime. I mean, I'm a child of the eighties and we know we've come a hell of a long way since then. So right. moving forward, just keep, keep moving the boulder. I respect that all the way. Um, I'm going to leave it with this last comment from Robert Billu says Max for president. And I have to co-sign those would be some glorious years for us to experience. Um, and I don't think that you could do any worse than what we've ever experienced as humans. So oh, Eric Cartman couldn't do any worse than this right now. <laughs> Max, thank you so very much for joining us. The conversation was enlightening. It was amazing. I thoroughly appreciate you taking the time and thank you for creating such wonderful works that is going to move us in so many different ways, both as a people and as thinkers, because that's what you do. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Thank you for having one of the coolest first names ever. I do what I can. Actually, it's my parents, but I'm going to take credit. So thanks again. All of you guys watching, we thoroughly appreciate you guys tuning in. Hope you had a blast. Definitely check up the replays. Uh, and again, sign up for wizardworldvirtual.com to get all the coolest things that you need to make your con experience a personal one. Love, peace, and chicken grease to all you guys. I'm the hardest working man in comics. Big D out.